Today we will begin with our third chapter in the semester of quantum field theory one. We have very, very extensively discussed free fields and the quantization of free fields. And now we will finally come to interactions and we will quite immediately discuss Feynman diagrams, which are of course an extremely useful tool to describe interactions in quantum field theory. And here I've already written down an outline of how we plan to do this topic and in particular how it compares with the video series from three years ago. Because this semester um, we will be very brief in our derivation of Feynman diagrams and Feynman rules. We will derive perturbation theory and Feynman rules for the S matrix, which is a special case, the most important case, most likely, but it's not the most general case. But that is what we will do. And we will focus here on three-level Feynman diagrams without closed loops. And uh, on, in particular, we will derive Feynman rules general enough for spin one-half and spin one fields like they appear in the standard model and in QED. Why will we be brief? First reason is the complementarity. I told you in the beginning of the semester that three years ago, the quantum field theory one lecture focused mainly on quantum aspects, on aspects which have to do with uh, the difference between classical and quantum theories, uh, the specific relationships between causality imposed on a quantum theory. And all of that, uh, these subtleties related to this were discussed in great detail and depth. And they have nothing to do with spin one half or spin one. But in this semester, we focus mainly on uh, the differences um, coming from non-vanishing spin. And therefore, uh, we have discussed at length the free field quantization, where there are very uh, strong differences, as you saw in the case of the spin one massless particle, which uh, where the free field quantization is much, much more complicated than the spin zero quantization. For interactions, however, the difference is extremely small and all the details can be discussed uh, with a case of spin zero and that is what we have done three years ago. So we will not uh, repeat that level of detail here and so you can watch those videos if you are interested in that. The second reason is a pedagogical one. It's extremely useful for you in my experience to learn the use of Feynman diagrams as early as possible because once you understand the language of Feynman diagrams and you are able to calculate Feynman diagrams, everything else becomes much clearer because you are always able to illustrate what is going on with the help of those Feynman diagrams. And in fact, today we will already learn how the Feynman diagrams work and uh, we learn the derivation of them um, from perturbation theory. Okay, so let me discuss a little bit more in detail what has happened three years ago so that you see the connection. And as you see, uh, the connection will come out here at the end. So there we also derived perturbation theory and Feynman diagrams, but we did it for a more general case, namely for so-called green functions, not only for S-matrix elements. And uh, then in this lecture seven, we did a critique of the mathematical details of those derivations because there are some mathematical subtleties involved, which are also involved in our derivation here. And uh, so those subtleties are discussed in detail and they give rise to the necessity of the so-called renormalization and regularization. That was then also discussed here in lecture eight. The basic point that you can uh, also understand in simple terms is this. You should really view uh, the interacting quantum field theory as a limit, as a limiting theory. You have to define a family of theories, let's say defined by some regularization procedure with a parameter epsilon, let's say. Then for each epsilon on zero, the theory is well defined and such derivations are correct. But then you take the limit where epsilon goes to zero, you obtain a limiting theory where the derivations here are not uh, well defined anymore, but the limit nevertheless exists, at least for observable quantities. But certain limits uh, for certain quantities might not exist, for example, for the Lagrangian 
the limit might not exist. And so you see that uh, Lagrangian and canonical quantization and these uh, things are really tools which help you to construct a quantum field theory, but at the end you obtain something new, namely the limit theory and uh, the Lagrangian and uh, these derivations that we do are tools in the construction, but the final result might be something else, namely an interacting quantum field theory. So that is discussed here, and then in some lectures we carry out this rigorous construction of renormalized Feynman diagrams and Green functions. And then in lecture 12 you can find uh, some physical and somehow philosophical remarks why this procedure should work at all and um, why it makes sense. Maybe just to illustrate this point here with the regularization, a very, very simple picture which is uh, correct uh, that you can have in mind is uh, space-time. Space-time is infinite and continuous and so uh, you can obtain that in two limits. Namely, first you can replace space-time by a finite set of space-time points, you know, uh, a finite number of points which have a finite distance from each other and the overall number is also finite. And uh, that would be such a regularization. And on this uh, finite number of space-time points, you can define a quantum theory where all the derivations are strictly mathematically correct. And then you perform the limit where the distance between neighboring points goes to zero and the overall number of points goes to infinity. So it's a double limit. And then you obtain the continuous uh, space-time and the theory defined on it. Then the next point is the S matrix, which we will discuss here as well. Uh, there, the S matrix was non-perturbatively constructed from the green functions defined before uh, via a so-called LSC theorem. And uh, this non-perturbative construction is useful because it is then also valid for bound states like the proton, hydrogen, atom, and so on. Uh, our derivation will not be valid, strictly speaking, for such bound states, but only for elementary particles. And uh, then in lecture 15 there, uh, we derive a special case, and that is actually the thing that we discuss. So here at the end, uh, you see also with some detailed comments how our approach fits into the picture developed there, and uh, how it is a special case which is valid under certain conditions, which are also explicitly spelled out there. So everything will be consistent, but we will use here the abbreviated derivation. And uh, my recommendation to you is that first we do our abbreviated derivation, and then later on, after you have developed some practice, you can watch those videos for your entertainment or to get some insights into those details. But let us uh, carry out our derivation. Let us begin with a definition of an interacting quantum field theory. First, let me explain our ansatz. We use again the Lagrangian and canonical quantization, like for the free fields. And why do we do that? Because uh, our section two has taught us that this Lagrangian approach, together with Noether's theorem, basically guarantees us that we get a unitary representation of the Poincaré group on our Hilbert space of states. That is the basic point. So this formalism is basically a guarantee that we end up with a fully relativistic quantum field theory. And that is why we use it. And our choice will be that we write down a Lagrangian, which I write as L, curly L, which is a free Lagrangian plus an interaction term. L0 plus L int, where 
This L0 is a free Lagrangian which is exactly one of the uh, free Lagrangians of our section two. So it can be any combination of L's from section two because we know exactly how to quantize them and we know exactly their interpretation. So we take as a free theory exactly the theories that we know. And uh, this interaction Lagrangian can be anything else, but we impose a few restrictions. First of all, we assume it to be local. So it depends only on fields at some uh, unique space-time point x. And of course, we assume it to be Lorentz invariant. And uh, then it is some combination of the fields which appear also in this L0. These are our assumptions. And that is maybe not the absolutely most general quantum field theory that we can construct in this way, but it's a special case based on such Lagrangians. But it's a very, very wide class of quantum field theories which contains all the modern important uh, examples like QED, standard model, and many, many extensions of the standard model all fall into that class. But of course, in general, one might also consider non-local Lagrangians or, of course, non-Lorentz invariant theories as well. But we do not do that. So that is our answer. Then let us collect a few quantities which might be of interest. And uh, so in section two, we have fully studied the quantization of the free Lagrangian L0. So that quantization is completely understood. And what is the result? In simple terms, the result of section two is that we have a full knowledge of uh, all operators connected to the quantum theory and all the states in our Hilbert space. So we have, generically speaking, field operators phi of x. We have creation annihilation operators A decker of P. We have a Hamiltonian, which I now call H0. The zero corresponds, of course, to the L0, but that is the Hamiltonian from our section two, which is now the free unperturbed Hamiltonian. And connected to it, we have a unitary representation of the Poincaré group, which I now call U0 of lambda A, which is, of course, uh, containing, for example, this free Hamiltonian H0. And it's constructed in the way we have <coughs> explained. So we have all that. Then we have also states, like the vacuum state, which is by definition, the ground state of the free Hamiltonian, H0. So this vacuum state is an eigenstate of H0 with eigenvalue 0, for example, without loss of generality. And then we have Fox states, A dagger, acting on the vacuum, and so on, which have the interpretation of free one-particle states and multi-particle states as well. OK, so we know all these objects, and they exist also in the interacting theory as uh, operators and um, states in the Hilbert space. Now we have, of course, in addition, the full theory. And the full theory is based on, for example, the full Hamiltonian H. That would be one of the first quantities that we can construct once we have the full Lagrangian. We have the full Hamiltonian, and we know certain equations of motion that must be satisfied by operators in the Heisenberg picture. So we will, for example, get some Heisenberg field operators, which I would call capital Phi of X. They are defined in the full theory in the Heisenberg picture, and they would satisfy equations of motions which are based on the commutator between the capital Phi and the full Hamiltonian H. That defines then the time derivative of those capital Phi's. 
And in general, there is uh, nothing like this a decker that doesn't exist. We just know equations of motion with a full Hamiltonian, but they are not solved by replacing the capital Phi by such a Fourier ansatz with a creation annihilation operators. That ansatz doesn't solve the equations of motion, so that doesn't exist. But what, of course, exists is, again, a unitary representation of the Poincaré group, which contains, for example, the full Hamiltonian H. And it contains additionally momentum and angular momentum and boost operators. Then there would be a full vacuum, which I call omega. And omega is by definition the ground state of the full Hamiltonian. So it's an eigenstate of this H with the lowest possible eigenvalue. And then there are other states. Okay. So these are quantities in the free theory and in the full theory. And one task could be to analyze the action of all those operators on all the possible states and determine eigenstates, eigenvalues of those operators, like in ordinary quantum mechanics. And that is a very difficult task, which we will not pursue here, at least not today. What we will pursue, however, is interactions and uh, scattering matrix elements, in other words, probability amplitudes for physical processes of asymptotically free particles. And for this purpose, we do not need to analyze all those objects uh, here in the second line. So we will work in the interaction picture. And then the objects in the first line are essentially sufficient. Then let us recap the notion of pictures in quantum mechanics. As you know, in quantum mechanics, there are different pictures to define the time evolution. And uh, the first most well-known one is the Schrödinger picture. In the Schrödinger picture, the states are time-dependent. And the time dependence of the states is directly given by the full Hamiltonian of the theory, whereas operators are time-independent. And so here we would have a state psi s of t, which has a certain time dependence. OK, let's write it down. I d by dt of that state is given by the full Hamiltonian acting on the state. Then we have the Heisenberg picture. In the Heisenberg picture, the states are time independent, but the operators carry the full time dependence. And so we can define in particular for each Schrödinger picture state a Heisenberg picture state, which is now time independent and which is obtained by e to the i h t acting on the time dependent Schrodinger picture state. And if you plug that in, then you see that the time dependence of the combination here vanishes because of that Schrodinger equation. And so the Heisenberg picture states are time independent and the operators in the Heisenberg picture, they are time dependent and their time dependence is governed by the commutator with a full H. And we have used that already in our section two. Then there is something in between the Dirac or so-called interaction picture, which is essentially the Heisenberg picture, but only for the free Hamiltonian H zero. So the states are almost time independent and the operators carry almost the full time dependence. And so we have here psi i of t is obtained by e to the i h zero times t acting on the Schrödinger picture state. And so if the perturbation vanishes, h and h zero are the same then this is, of course, also time independent. But if there is a perturbation which is small, then the time dependence of that is small. 
and the time dependence of the operators is given by a commutator with h0, of course. So, and you can write this also with a double exponential e to the i h0 times t and then e to the minus i h times t acting on the Heisenberg state. So for the Heisenberg, you first go to the Schrödinger picture and then to the interaction picture. And these operators do not commute. That is why you cannot easily bring it into one exponential function, but that is how the pictures are related. And so let me put here, oops, just the final formula. Namely, what is exactly the time evolution in the interaction picture? In the interaction picture, first the operators, as I said, have a time dependence as follows. d by dt of some operator in the interaction picture of t is given by the commutator with h0. Okay. And this equation is the equation which is fulfilled by our operators in section 2. They satisfy this equation. Now h0 is always a Hamiltonian corresponding to our section 2. Therefore, all the operators constructed in section 2 with all their detailed properties satisfy this equation and therefore they solve it. Yes? Is there a risk of somewhere? Oh, yeah. Here. Thanks. So this is satisfied by the operators of section 2. Then we can generally split the Hamiltonian into uh, the free Hamiltonian H0 plus a perturbation, which I call V, and that is assumed to be small. And this equality um, might look differently in the different pictures because, of course, the operators need to be defined in some pictures. But at t equals 0, all the pictures agree, and so this equation holds at t equals 0 in all pictures. Okay. And then from that equality at t equals 0, you might derive what kind of equation holds at other times in the various pictures where the operators might be time dependent. So for example, this operator is not time dependent in the Heisenberg picture because it commutes with itself. That operator is not time independent in the interaction picture because it commutes with itself, but the opposite is not true. So in the interaction picture, that is time dependent, and that is time independent, and that is time dependent in our interaction picture. And so indeed, it is now important to define V in the interaction picture at an arbitrary time, Vi of t, which is given by e to the i h0 times t times v times e to the minus i h0 times t. So that is the general transformation uh, for the interaction picture. And then we get a Schrödinger equation for states, namely i d by dt of a state psi i of t in the interaction picture is given by this v i of t acting on psi i of t, okay? So in the uh, interaction picture, the Hamiltonian which governs the time evolution is just this v i, the perturbation, which is time dependent in the interaction picture, and that is then the Schrödinger equation fulfilled by our states. So that is the time evolution in the interaction picture. And the interaction picture is good because we know which operators satisfy those equations of motion, namely the ones of section two. 
let us next define scattering. And the S matrix, which is the main object that we want to study. And we begin with the definition. So the situation of scattering is uh, the same as that you know from classical mechanics. You have simply particles that are essentially non-interacting for a long while and that move together. Then they interact and after the interaction they essentially become non-interacting again and move away from the interaction. So the classical example is a billiard ball collision and uh, that same situation can be used in quantum mechanics. And so we will have here a certain particles with momenta P1 and maybe some certain spins and up to Pm, various initial state particles and uh, momenta and in the final state we have also a certain number of particles with momenta p1 prime up to pn prime. And of course in quantum field theory the number of particles can change in an interaction and therefore in general we have m not equal to n. We can start with two particles colliding and end up with three or more final state particles. So we will use here momentum eigenstates for the initial and final states, but if you really uh, think about the interaction, then you should of course mathematically and physically correctly describe the whole thing by wave packets. Because what does it mean, a uh, momentum eigenstate? A momentum eigenstate has no localization in space, right? Uh, therefore it makes no sense to say you have a momentum eigenstate particle which comes from somewhere and collides with another particle at a certain interaction point. In order to describe that you need a wave packet which is approximately localized in space and approximately localized in momentum space. And then you can say this particle moves in this direction, that particle moves towards the same point, then they interact in a small region of space at a small interval in time and afterwards they move away from each other. So the correct description would be one in terms of wave packets, but we will not do that. Instead, we define our initial state with those um, uh, momentum eigenstates. And so our initial state in the interaction picture is called I for initial state, uh, capital I for interaction picture, and of T because in the interaction picture the states depend on time. And so what we require is that uh, for very, very uh, long time ago in the past, the particles were free. And so that means if we take the limit T going to minus infinity, then that state becomes a state uh, indicated in the figure, namely a combination of momentum eigenstates. So in words, it becomes a free eigenstate of the free Hamiltonian H0 corresponding to the particles with momenta P1 up to Pm. So that is our initial state. And so we assume that in the infinite past, the time evolution stops. What does it mean that the time evolution stops? It means in the interaction picture that the interaction vanishes. If the interaction vanishes, the time evolution stops. That is exactly the point. And so therefore, that is exactly what we assume. That is the condition for an initial state of a scattering process. And so obviously the same assumption is made for the final state. If 
eigenstate fi of t, i stands for interaction picture, f for a final, and the t dependence comes because we work in the interaction picture. And of course, here we assume that in the infinite future, for t going to plus infinity, the time evolution stops. It becomes a constant, and it goes into a free eigenstate corresponding to p1 prime up to pn prime. Okay. So, and then uh, with our theory, in principle, we can calculate, and uh, the theory determines what is the time evolution of both states. So the states have some boundary conditions at plus or minus infinity. But uh, in general, they are simply states in our theory with uh, this Schrodinger equation. So we know exactly well how the time evolve. And so the question is now, physics question, what is the probability amplitude if you prepare the initial state in the infinite past to find the final state in the infinite future? That is the question. And so it's a question on a probability amplitude. So we start by preparing this initial state at t equal minus infinity. And we ask the probability amplitude to find the final state at uh, t equal plus infinity. And uh, of course, we uh, have to time evolve our initial state to the time plus infinity, right? So we prepare our state, then nature does its thing. The state evolves under time from minus infinity to plus infinity. Then an experimentalist does an experiment and asks this question. And so therefore, we have here minus infinity, plus infinity, and also here plus infinity. That is exactly the quantum mechanical formulation of the question asked by the sketched scattering process. And so there is a similar notation or a similar formulation in the Heisenberg picture, which I uh, taught to some of you in quantum mechanics too. So let me just write down uh, this. There is in the Heisenberg picture a so-called out state f out, and in an initial state i in. And so in the Heisenberg picture, the same uh, answer to the same question would simply look like this. You have two Heisenberg picture states, which have, of course, no time dependence, therefore no t argument. But they have labels in and out. And then simply this scalar product is the answer to the same question. So I think uh, I did that only two years ago in the quantum mechanics lecture. But this is also the notation used in the lecture from three years ago in quantum field theory. So you might see such a notation appearing there. But we will work in the interaction picture. And in the interaction picture, the scattering question is, you prepare something in the infinite past, let it evolve and interact, and then do an experiment in the infinite future and ask what is the probability to see that final state. So that's a perfectly quantum mechanical question with a perfectly quantum mechanical answer. And our task is now to calculate this scalar product between the two states in the interaction picture. And the answer will be given by Feynman diagrams. So in order to get there, let us look at time-dependent perturbation theory. This is a repetition of uh, material done in quantum mechanics too. So we can write the time evolution in the interaction picture using a unitary time evolution operator. So you can write your state at time t 
as a unitary operator ui of t comma t zero acting on the interaction picture state at some earlier time t zero. Okay, so that is like the solution to the Schrödinger equation. You can uh, directly write the solution in terms of such an, a time evolution operator, and then. The operator, of course, needs to satisfy the Schrödinger equation, namely i d by dt of this uh, operator u i of t comma t zero must be v uh, i of t acting on u i of t comma t zero, because if it satisfies this equation, then uh, the definition at the top satisfies the Schrödinger equation. Remember, the time evolution of this state here is given by this operator vi of t acting on the state. So if the operator ui satisfies this, that equation, then this ansatz satisfies the Schrödinger equation. And then, of course, you can define an operator or construct an operator solving the equation. And uh, for consistency, the operator should also satisfy this. If you put into equal time arguments, then of course it should map a state to itself. So for equal time arguments, it's the unit operator. Therefore, we have now introduced an operator ui of t comma t zero with two time arguments with um, two conditions, namely a boundary condition for equal times and a differential equation for non-equal times. And the two combined completely determine the operator because it's a first order differential equation. So the operator is completely determined by the two conditions. We have a unique solution. And once we have that, we can obtain the time evolution of any uh, interaction picture state. And so what is the solution? The solution is given by the following namely ui of t comma t zero is the time ordered product of the exponential function e to the minus i times integral from t zero to t dt prime of vi of t prime. Now my question is, do you need some uh, proof for this because I think we have done it in quantum mechanics too. Maybe you have done it even in quantum mechanics one as well. So this is the time ordering, which orders all these operators according to uh, increasing time arguments. And the exponential function is de defined by its uh, uh, power series expansion. Okay. So if you now take, uh, try it, you take the derivative with respect to t, then you get uh, an inner derivative from the exponential function. The inner derivative is minus i times the upper uh, limit of the integrand, which is exactly minus i times vi of t in front. And so then you see that this ansatz exactly solves the Schrodinger equation at the top. So if you want more details, then we might also discuss them in the exercise. But uh, otherwise, let me know questions. Then we can rewrite this uh, by using that our V, the interaction Hamiltonian, is actually given now by our interaction Lagrangian because we have defined the Hamiltonian by the Legendre transform of the Lagrangian. The Lagrangian contains this L0 and the L int for the interaction. And so in the simplest case, the interaction Hamiltonian is simply minus the interaction Lagrangian minus D3x of the L int integral uh, because in most cases, 
Nothing changes with the Legendre transformation with these canonical momenta, pi and so on. They do not change and therefore normally uh, the interaction Hamiltonian is simply minus the interaction Lagrangian. So this assumes no change in the Legendre transformation. which is, for example, the case if there are no time derivatives in the interaction Lagrangian. We can discuss later what happens in the other cases. So, okay, let us assume that um, at t equal zero. So in the Schrödinger picture, uh, this needs to be evaluated for the time independent operators and one could then also go to the interaction picture in interaction picture. This vi of t is then simply given by minus d3x of the l int in the interaction picture. And that is simply uh, l int with operators of section two inserted, right? Because the operators of section two, they are time dependent and their time dependence came from the commutator with H zero. So in the language of section two, our operators were defined in the Heisenberg picture, but in the language that we use now, uh, Heisenberg with respect to H0 means interaction picture. So the operators of our section two, they are defined now automatically in the interaction picture. Therefore, if you write down literally the interaction Lagrangian density and you plug in the field operators of section two with uh, the creation and annihilation operators and the time dependence from there, then we have automatically our interaction Hamiltonian in the interaction picture, which is what we need here. And then we can actually give an explicit expression for our question, namely we can define S, Fi, the S matrix element. Okay, maybe I should add here the definition S, Fi. This is the definition of the S matrix. I forgot uh, that. <laughs> <laughs> Even though the title asks us to define the S matrix. So that is the definition of the S matrix, uh, or precisely speaking, the S matrix element S F i from this initial state to that final state is given by this matrix element. And now we can write the answer, namely that scalar product S F i, how is it given? We know the time evolution of the state from minus infinity to plus infinity is given by this time evolution operator. And we can plug in for the times plus infinity and minus infinity, which provides us with the uh, integration borders minus infinity and plus infinity. So we integrate over all of time. That generates the time evolution of that state from minus infinity to plus infinity. And then we have the scalar product between the final result here of our state, let's say f i at plus infinity, which was this time independent state, which is an eigenstate of the free Hamiltonian with certain momentum assignments. And then we have here this uh, time evolution operator, which is now t of d to the plus i d 4x l int in the interaction picture. And then here, our initial state at time minus infinity. Okay. So this is now the very nice and simple result. To explain it once again, we start with our initial state defined at t equal minus infinity. And for this time, we know what the state is. It's an eigenstate with certain definite particles and definite momenta, eigenstates of our free Hamiltonian with a known particle content. 
Then we do time evolution from minus infinity to plus infinity, and that is now simply an integral over all of space-time d4x with no limits of the interaction Lagrangian in the interaction picture. And then we do the matrix element with the final state at time plus infinity, which is also a simple eigenstate with definite particles and momentum eigens eigenvalues. Okay. And therefore, this expression is an expression where we know everything. We know everything. We know exactly the state, which, is, uh, which contains certain particles, uh, certain particles. And so it can be written like a dagger of P1 and so on <coughs> acting on the vacuum. So this is a state like that. Here, this is an exponential of the interaction Lagrangian in the interaction picture, which means that here the field operators of section two appear. The field operators of section two, they have a completely known behavior on such states. They can also be expressed in terms of creation annihilation operators. So here there are psi hat, phi hat, a hat, mu from section two. They have a known behavior on such states and uh, the final state has the same form as the initial state. And so therefore in principle everything that you see here is known. That means we can calculate it. And this is our interaction picture representation of the S matrix. In principle, it is now fully defined for any final and initial state and for any interaction Lagrangian. And now what is left to do for us is to calculate it with the help of some examples. And that will lead us to Feynman diagrams and Feynman rules. Do you maybe have some questions before we go on? Yep. Yeah, just a short question. In the solution for the um, interaction, um, I, can you explain why the V has to be small? Because it's so spacious. Yeah, uh, the interaction has to be small. Here, you mean? Yeah. So, of course, that is the basic assumption of perturbation theory that the interaction is small. So, what small exactly means? Uh, is not discussed here, but we assume it is small enough that uh, low orders in perturbation theory give us a sufficiently good approximation to the full answer. But does this equation also uh, maybe... Um, I mean, uh, this equation, of course, has to assume that the series converges. Okay. So, but it's always also possible, and that is often the, uh, um, let's say, the solution to avoid contradictions that all equations that we write down, they are valid order by order in perturbation theory. So you can make a formal expansion of all our equations and then compare first order, second order, and all the orders match. And uh, this does not then require that such power series actually converges. And sometimes it really happens in quantum mechanics that uh, such a series expansion does not converge. You can easily write down mathematical examples where a power exponential function does not converge. And uh, then maybe the whole sum as a mathematical limit does not exist, but order by order, nevertheless, our equations make sense. And you can say uh, up to a certain order, the S matrix is really given exactly by that expression, also expanded up to the same order. And uh, it might not necessarily always be the case that this uh, operator here converges in the sense of a mathematical limit where the exponential power series converges and where the integral converges and so on. So there are these kind of mathematical subtleties appearing here. Well, uh, it contains typically coupling constants, which are then small. 
and uh, there is a dimensionless combination here appearing, dt times v, that is dimensionless, and so of course you have a dimensionless quantity which in absolute terms can be small. But, uh, I mean, I, I didn't want to discuss all these subtleties, but I refer you to the, what was it, eight videos where the subtleties are discussed, which I mentioned in the beginning, so I do not, but I don't want to completely kill the discussion, but I would like to discuss Feynman diagrams today so that you can go into the Christmas holidays with the knowledge of Feynman diagrams and not only with the knowledge of mathematical subtleties. But uh, to answer your question, um, in a, Relativistic theory, we have the problem that uh, um, interactions are translationally invariant. If we have translationally invariant interactions, how can we expect an integral over all of space-time to converge? There is no way. This can't converge. And that is one of the many reasons why we have to go to this picture of first defining our theory, for example, on a finite number of space-time points, where this can absolutely converge, uh, and then we take the limit uh, to infinitely many space-time points. So these are reasons like this. So in quantum mechanics too, uh, not in your year, but in the other year, we define, for example, the Müller operator for scattering, and uh, the convergence and the existence of the Müller operator has certain conditions which are not fulfilled here because of exactly such reasons. And then again, also we asked ourselves there whether the interaction picture makes sense or whether this Heisenberg picture discussion makes more sense. And I mean, the answer, if you are really strict in this Lorentz invariant theory, the Heisenberg picture uh, definition of the scattering matrix in terms of such so-called in and out state that continues to make perfect sense whereas this is an approximation which is valid uh, under these certain mathematical subtleties regarding convergence of all sorts of quantities. And so what we say here uh, is true order by order in perturbation theory, and it is true in a regularized theory, for example, in a theory where we replace space-time by a finite number of points, but we will not write that down explicitly. This is just our background knowledge we will formulate all our derivations using the language of continuum space-time. And uh, at the end, uh, we can discuss also to what extent our formulas that we derive are valid, to what extent they are exactly true, and to what extent they need to be modified in order to cope with other situations. And I can tell you the answer right up front. For the example Feynman diagrams that we will look at here, what we will say is exactly correct and will never be changed again. But uh, there are uh, Feynman diagrams with closed loops, which we will not discuss, at least not this week, uh, where uh, those subtleties will play a role. Other questions? Yeah, I had a question. I mean, I had derived the tiny Bowman operator at least one time, but I can quite remember why where the problem arise when I don't write the time ordering operator in front of the E? It's because of the non-commutativity. The different factors of the VI do not commute with each other. So if you have the power series expansion, they don't commute. And you must make sure that if you take the derivative, the VI with the highest time appears on the left. And that is guaranteed by the time ordering. And so because of that, uh, you get this Schrödinger equation as opposed to a Schrödinger equation where the thing is multiplied from the right with vi of t or where it appears in the middle between such exponential factors, which would not be the correct solution. Okay. Let us then discuss Feynman rules for the S matrix. And we will mainly develop the Feynman rules with the help of some cleverly chosen examples from which you can immediately read off what the general rules are. And uh, I will actually begin by stating 
what the Feynman rules are, and then we will discuss certain examples which will show you why that is true. And we will do all of that immediately in the case of QED. But this lecture is not an introduction to QED as such. I will drop the Lagrangian from the sky and then we will use it to motivate and to discuss Feynman rules. And later in the semester we will discuss QED in earnest and then really provide motivations, discussions and so on. But let's here only look at the Lagrangian of QED which is minus 1 over 4 f mu nu f mu nu minus 1 over 2 psi d mu a mu square, which is the gauge fixing that we have now analyzed and understood. Then plus psi bar i d slash minus m psi for the fermion field. Okay. So this is the free fermion term that we discussed in our section 2. That is the free Maxwell term plus gauge fixing that we also discussed in our section 2 and we will choose psi equal one at least today. Then for the interaction, in general I told you that we want to have a Lorentz invariant and local interaction which consists somehow of the fields appearing here and so one Lorentz invariant combination is this one where we combine psi bar psi and a mu because we already know that psi bar gamma mu psi is a four vector and a mu is more or less also a four vector with some subtleties attached to it because of uh, gauge fixing. But anyway, that is a Lorentz invariant term and let's give it some prefactor minus eq where q for me is normalized such that q for the electron is equal to minus one and so e here is the elementary charge um, and Q is then an integer which specifies the uh, detailed charge values for uh, different particles and for the electron we choose it to be minus one. So the interaction Lagrangian has the form J mu A mu where J mu is a four vector so that you see the structure so it looks like the interaction type that we have discussed the last time in the case of the massless spin one photon. And uh, so the charge, uh, the current here that we define in this way is actually conserved, but we don't prove it. As I said, we just drop this Lagrangian from the sky and use it to derive Feynman rules. So from now on, I will always write operators without heads because from now on we know what we are dealing with, we are quantum field theorists and therefore everything that we do is operators. So we do not write hats anymore. And then let me just write down uh, the expansion of our fields, which we know. So for the fermion field, psi of x, we have dp tilde sum over s, then u of p comma s, uh, and I call it now b of p comma s, e to the minus ipx and so um, the b is now the creation annihilation operator for electrons. Uh, previously we called it a but we need to avoid a to avoid contradictions. Uh, then b of p comma s and then I say d dagger of p s e to the plus ipx. So the two operators are called b and d for the uh, electrons and positrons uh, and we avoid A because we use A for the photon. A mu of x is dp tilde integral sum over lambda epsilon mu of p comma lambda then A of p comma lambda e to the minus ipx plus the Hermitian conjugate. And uh, so then we have three creation annihilation operators in our theory namely A for the photon, B for the electron, and D for the positron. And except for the change in letters, these are the operators from our section two. And then uh, the L int of 
i of x is exactly the l in above with these field operators plugged in. So these field operators have exactly the time dependence corresponding to our interaction picture. Therefore, if we are asked to write down the operator L int i of x, then uh, we literally write down this and plug in those expressions for the operators. Now, let us write down the Feynman rules. And I think I want to have this nicely on one blackboard. Probably this is not sufficient. Let's try, maybe it works. So uh, the rules, so this will then be a big important box for you. So the S matrix element is given by a Kronecker delta, delta Fi. So that is zero if the initial and final states are not equal, which uh, we always assume to be the case, plus two pi to the fourth times a four dimensional delta function corresponding to momentum conservation. So this is the sum over all the final state momenta minus the sum of all the initial state momenta times TFI. So we first rewrite the S matrix element like this. And you see that it contains this uh, object here which vanishes in all the interesting cases, so we will always ignore this delta term. Then there is this delta function corresponding to momentum conservation that will always be a factor in the final result. So therefore it's interesting to give a notation for the remaining quantity, which is of course the interesting quantity. So we will not always want to write down this delta function because it's always there. We want to write down this TFI, and actually we, by definition, write here an i in front of the TFI. Then this i times TFI is given by the sum of all possible Feynman diagrams. And the Feynman rules are as follows. There are Feynman rules for external lines, Feynman rules for internal lines, and Feynman rules for vertices for the dots in the lines. What are the Feynman rules for external lines? There are Feynman rules for an incoming photon. So for me, the process always goes from left to right. Question? Sorry, I wanted to ask about the plus, uh, because there is no function up there. The states aren't the same, then it doesn't ensure that everything is zero because there's a function plus this other term? This delta fi plus the other term, yes. So it's a plus. So if the states are equal, then we get here an additional contribution, uh, which of course also contains a delta function for momentum conservation. But if the states are different, which is the interesting case, then uh, the result contains only this term. Uh, I'm not exactly sure whether I understand the reason for your confusion. Um, probably not. I was just confused because there was a thing that the delta function is supposed to make everything go zero if they're not the same. No, of course. Uh, yeah. So you you have expected that this is a product of, but it's not. I mean, this delta function uh, means that the states are exactly the same. So every final state particle has the same momentum as every initial state particle. So no interaction at all occurs, no uh, change between initial and final state occurs. Uh, so that is a very boring case, which however, of course, might happen in nature, but we are not interested in it. But the real scattering is that you have some initial state particles, they change their momentum, they change their directions, maybe some E plus E minus pairs are being created, but the sum of the momentum and energy is of course conserved. But the number of particles and their directions might not be conserved and that is why we always have this delta function for the momenta. But the delta function 
can be a non-zero, for example, even if the particle number is changed. Then we might have momentum conservation. And then we get this interesting, the relevant uh, T matrix element, which is really the interesting part of the scattering. And so for that, the Feynman rules applies. And so we, I always throw it from left to right. So this is an incoming photon. And the rule for the incoming photon is epsilon mu of p comma lambda. If uh, we have here an incoming photon in our process, which comes in with momentum p and polarization lambda, then this is the rule uh, associated to it. So you see here exactly our polarization vectors epsilon that we have discussed at length. Similarly, for a final state photon, which uh, is in the final state, then you get a complex conjugate polarization vector epsilon mu star. In our choice, they are real, but you might use complex choices as well. Then we have uh, four different cases for the fermions. We have an incoming electron, so E minus incoming, with momentum P and uh, spin S. We have a final state electron, E minus, with momentum P and spin S. But we also have an incoming positron, E plus, with momentum P and spin S. And so, attention, the convention is that uh, there is an arrow on the fermion line which indicates whether uh, an electron or a positron is flowing in a certain direction. So for the incoming electron, I draw the line in this direction with the arrow pointing into the same direction as the incoming electron. But for the positron, the convention is that the positron comes in and the arrow is in the opposite direction and that indicates that we are talking about a positron. And similarly here for the outgoing positron, we draw it like this. That is an outgoing positron with momentum P and spin S. So that arrow below here just indicates graphically that we are talking about an incoming positron where the momentum P flows into the diagram. And that line arrow here indicates that it's a positron. And so what are the rules? The rules are the wave functions appearing in our field operator. For the electron, we get this U, U of P comma S. For the outgoing electron, we get U bar of P comma S. For the incoming positron, we get V bar of P comma S. And for the outgoing positron, we get V without bar of P comma S. Why for the outgoing positron we have V without bar? Because the photon field here contains a generated positron together with V, but a destroyed electron together with U. Therefore, this opposite uh, association here. So these are the external lines for incoming and outgoing photons, electrons, and positrons. And they contain the wave functions which appear in uh, the field operators in front of the corresponding creation or annihilation operators. Then we have a vertex. The vertex looks like this. The vertex connects three lines, a photon line and two fermion lines where the arrows flow into one direction. And the value is, the mathematical value is minus I, E, Q, gamma mu. Minus I, E, Q, gamma mu. Then we have momentum conservation. At each vertex. And finally, uh, is that sufficient? Maybe let's, let's do it like this. We have the internal lines. 
we have on the one hand an internal line for the photon. This incoming line, uh, internal line, connects two dots. And at each dot, there is a, let's say, photon field defined a mu, a nu. And there is a momentum p flowing through the line in one direction. Then the line has the value minus i times metric tensor g mu nu divided by the momentum square, p square, plus i epsilon, where, uh, okay, uh, I will explain the epsilon later. And then the line for the fermions has an arrow, and it corresponds here to psi bar at this point, psi at the other point, momentum p flowing through the line, and the value is i divided by p slash minus m plus i epsilon, where this uh, denominator p slash is meant as an inverse matrix. So the epsilon here is, epsilon is bigger than zero, but epsilon is always uh, taken the limit to zero. So this is important if you have some integrations over those propagators, then uh, you need to interpret the integrals as integrals in the complex plane. And this i epsilon with a very small but positive epsilon determines values coming from residue theorem and so on. But this is irrelevant for us. This is the set of Feynman rules. And now let's finally derive it with the help of some examples. Examples at order L int. So we use now our general uh, ansatz for the S matrix and evaluate the, the power series exactly at the first order in the interaction. Then of course no uh, convergence questions arise for the power series at least, but we look at this order specifically. And then we look at the process AMU goes to E plus E minus at this order and see what happens. All right, I hope that this still works today. So, let us begin, okay? This is now an important part of the lecture. You should really uh, follow these derivations closely and do a lot of similar derivations at home because this is on the one hand simple, but it takes a lot of practice in order to really wrap your head around all the different elements of uh, the quantities. Because as you see, there are a lot of intermediate uh, technical quantities which need to appear in order to understand all the different rules. None of it is difficult, but it's a lot and it's kind of a new formalism, therefore it takes practice. Let us write down the quantum mechanical um, matrix element that corresponds to what I've said here. What does it mean? We have the S matrix for this process. That means we have an initial state, an initial state with one photon. How do we write an initial state with one photon? We write it as the vacuum, and onto the vacuum there acts a decker of p comma lambda. That describes our initial state with one photon. Then we have our final state, our final state with a positron and an electron is written as the vacuum, and onto the vacuum we act with uh, the operator D of, let's say, P, what is it? P2 prime S2 prime, and the operator B of P1 prime S1 prime. Okay. So if you reverse it, then it is like acting with D dagger and B dagger onto the vacuum. 
And so this creates out of the vacuum a positron with momentum P2 prime, spin S2 prime, and this creates an electron with spin P, uh, P1 prime and S1 prime. So these are our initial and final states. And now in between we have our time evolution operator, which is the exponential of e to the integral uh, of the L int. So at first order, uh, the time ordering doesn't exist because it's only one factor. And uh, then the only thing that exists is exactly this i times integral d4x of L int in the interaction picture at x. That is exactly the matrix element that we have to evaluate. And now, let us abbreviate it. So you now understand uh, what we need to do. Now, once we understand it, of course, we need a more compact notation because otherwise you do not see anything. And uh, the compact notation is that we forget the arguments. Then we have d, b, i, and from the l int, we have minus eq, so we get the combination i times minus eq, that is the number minus i eq, and then we have psi bar gamma mu psi times a mu times a dagger acting on the vacuum. And then we have here somewhere an integral over the variable x. And so I drop all arguments, but you must remember which object has which argument. It should be obvious, but uh, you cannot keep writing down the arguments, otherwise you don't see anything. Good. So far, so good. What is, uh, what is the nature of uh, this object here? We have vacuum on the right, vacuum on the left, and in between we have many, many operators. But all of the operators are known. How many operators do we have? One, two, three, four, five, six. Six operators and they have all a known behavior. So we have a creation operator, we have annihilation operators, and we have field operators. And the field operators, of course, are a linear combination of creation and annihilation operators. So using maybe some colors, we know this contains A and A dagger. That contains B and D dagger. This contains B dagger and D. So, for example, you can immediately tell me that certain of the red terms give zero as an exercise, an initial exercise for you to practice looking at such things. Some of the red operators give zero. Which ones and why? No. Right. So we can commute B with A and A dagger, and also with that A dagger, then B acts onto the vacuum and therefore gives zero. Clear to everybody? Okay. Yep. And also A, small A, because it commutes with the B and D to the left. Yeah, A dagger, I mean. To the left, and so it gives zero to the vacuum on the left. Okay, so in order to see that, you have to commute to the left. It commutes with everything, and then A dagger hits onto the vacuum. That is like A acting on the vacuum gives zero, right? So that vanishes, that vanishes. What about something here or there? Nothing else, so the rest might contribute. Uh, actually, the D here probably also does not contribute. Uh, no, it does, okay. So, uh, from this simple exercise, you get maybe the idea how you can evaluate the whole thing in general. 
namely the idea is that uh, you need to uh, make sure that somehow you use commutation relations until uh, A acts onto the vacuum or B or D acts on the vacuum and then you know that you get zero. And then from intermediate steps you get something non-zero from applying commutation relations. So the strategy to evaluate all these matrix elements is to take uh, operators on the left which are always um, annihilation operators. And so you commute the B now, let's take the B, you commute it more and more to the right until at some point the B acts onto the vacuum and then you get zero. But from intermediate steps you get non-zero and if we concretely take the B, where do we get something non-zero? So you commute it with psi bar, psi bar contains B dagger and the commutator or anti-commutator between B and B dagger is not zero, you get something, you will get some number, let's say, therefore the, uh, you can rewrite this as that anti-commutator which is non-zero plus the term where the B sits here, right? And the term where the B sits here gives zero because then B commutes with the rest and gives zero. So from this B we get exactly one contribution which is the anti-commutator between B and Psi bar. And so therefore we, uh, first let's write down the strategy, commute B and D to the right and then we get non-zero anti or commutator terms. And so we need at least today evaluate a few terms like this and we introduce a notation The notation is what is called a contraction. We define this symbol where you take two operators, B psi bar, and uh, do such a square bracket below them, connecting them, this is called a contraction. And the symbol is defined as the anti-commutator between the two. So anti-commutator with plus because it's two fermions. And, uh, this result here of the anti-commutator is of course some number. It is some number that we compute later, but it is some number. So the number is the same as if we take the vacuum expectation value of itself, okay, just to rewrite the whole expression. And if we have the uh, vacuum expectation value of the anti-commutator, then we see that in this expectation value only one term contributes, namely the one where B is on the left. So this is the same as the vacuum expectation value of just this expression in one particular ordering. Okay. So these are all different ways to rewrite this expression. Anyway, you can compute it in all those ways and it is defined as this simple B with Psi bar. Using that simple, we can now rewrite the expression in this way that uh, this whole thing is equal to the contraction between B and Psi bar plus the term where B is on the right and that term then gives zero. So therefore the expression is equal integral of D and then we have this. Uh, let's uh, remove the numerical factors D, B and then we have this contraction with psi bar, gamma mu, psi, a mu, a dagger, and a. So, and this symbol is now a number. This symbol is now a number. So, and uh, that is equal because the other term where b is on the right gives zero. b acts onto the vacuum and gives zero. And so that is a number. So we could pull it out of the matrix element, but we can also leave it here. But anyway, we should know that it's a number. And so therefore the D of course commutes now with this number. Then D stands here, D also commutes uh, with a gamma mu. 
And then you can do the same trick with the D and Psi. We commute D with Psi or anti-commute. Afterwards, D would be on the right. It acts onto the vacuum and gives zero. So the only contribution is actually from this contraction. And that double symbol means that we do this contraction. This gives a number. Then afterwards, we do that contraction. That means we replace the D and Psi by the number corresponding to this definition here. And that is the result of uh, the matrix element. And afterwards, these are all numbers. And what remains is the expectation value of just this product, A mu times A decker. There we do exactly the same thing. Namely, we commute uh, A dagger to the left. And then we define such a contraction. Namely, we define contraction A mu with A dagger. Is of course also defined in the same way, A mu with A dagger, which is also the vacuum expectation value of A mu and A dagger, which is also the vacuum expectation value of the thing without commutator. And using uh, that notation, you can now see that the matrix element is actually uh, now pure, for fully calculated because everything is replaced by a number. So that is a number. This other contraction is a number. That is a number. And uh, then we have gamma mu matrix elements, which are also numbers. So we have the vacuum expectation value of a number. Mm -hmm. The norm of the vacuum is one. Therefore, the whole expression is really just a number and we can write it down d4x integral of the following, namely this contraction, which is a number, times gamma mu, times minus i e q, times d psi contraction, which is also a number, times a mu a dagger, which is a number, and uh, that's it. That is the computation of the matrix element. And we have a product of three numbers coming from commutators. Uh, and uh, uh, let's say connected to some prefactors minus i e q and gamma mu coming from the exact form of the Lagrangian. All right, time is over. This is how it works. And so the next time we will calculate what are actually the values of those contractions. And we will do further examples. And all of the examples combined will show you that the rules stated here are correct and uh, where they come from. And I mean, just uh, to uh, make it clear, of course, this contraction here, the commutator, will give rise to an epsilon. That will give rise to a u of, or v of p comma s. That will give rise to u bar of p comma s. Okay. We will do that next time. But in that way, you see that you get these rules for the external particles, u bar, v, and epsilon coming from exactly those contractions. And uh, also the delta function will appear next time from uh, the integral that will turn out to be a Fourier integral giving the delta function and so on. So we will continue tomorrow with this. Okay, so see you tomorrow.